Welcome, everyone. Let me just try that one more time. Good evening. Welcome, and I'm so glad that you're here. For those of you who had dinner, I, I know you ate well, and I'm so glad that, that you came. For anyone who just joined us tonight, I want to say welcome to you. Uh, we have a few folks who are coming here from other churches or in the community. Welcome to you. Uh, my name is Reverend Chris Eckert, and I have the privilege of serving here as the senior pastor. Um, and I want to welcome all the folks worshiping, or not worshiping, but joining us online tonight. We have folks uh, from our community and from beyond. We're really grateful for you. Tonight, uh, we have a, a great guest who's come to us from Bristol, England, uh, David Worthington. And I'm going to kind of tee him up a little more in, in a moment. But as we're waiting for a few more friends to come, um, I know that the, the Wednesday night dinner folks just sang some hymns. But we're going to sing a Wesleyan hymn. Uh, this this hymn is uh, was written by Charles Wesley, and this was sung at every annual Holy Conference or uh, Methodist Conference when the societies would come together. Pay attention to these. Uh, pay attention to the lyrics of this song, and think about if you're coming back together every year in a community like this, and you're saying this is the way that you open up every year. You're singing this song again, so pay attention. I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Cricket and uh, Susan to come and lead us in, in singing And Are We Yet Alive? And I would ask, if you can stand as you're able, let's stand and sing together. Good evening, everyone. I, I'm Pastor Kison Yang, serving as an associate pastor here. So I welcome you. And shall we go to God in prayer together? A loving and gracious God, thank you so much for this evening as we gather together in your name to learn more about you and to learn more about our heritage we cherish. We thank you for David Worthington, our guest speaker, who is visiting us and who will teach us tonight. We open our hearts and mind, and we open and uh, welcome your spirit to teach us and inspire us, O oh Lord. We are so grateful for all the connections you provide us, all the grace you provide to us. O oh Lord, help us to grow deeper and wider in love 
Help us to be perfected in your love on our journey together. We pray all these in the name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. In 2022, Pastor g s u n and I joined a group of Methodists from the United States and other countries to go to England to learn a little more about our Wesleyan or our early Methodist heritage. And one of the sites that was an unexpected favorite among the group and also uh, g s u n and I was Bristol, England, John Wesley's new room, which happens to be the very first Methodist building ever built, a preaching house built there in Bristol. And when we went into that very old, beautiful space, there was this person who told some stories that I had read about in seminary but did not come alive like the way that he told them. And I've, it's just amazing how God has connected the dots. And David Worthington, the director of global relationships from the New Room, happens to be in the United States traveling around. He's been uh, on this trip already in New York, in Philadelphia, uh, Delaware, and is going to Maryland before he leaves. David uh, is a huge American baseball fan and has been to all, how many parks are there? 30. He's been to all 30 parks. Um, and if you want to talk baseball, you can do that after this tonight. Um, but David is going to share with us our, our Methodist roots and heritage in Bristol and what that meant when Methodism came to the American colonies in the United States. And uh, real quick, I've been teaching a class on Methodist history. Um, if you've been in that class, can you just raise your hand? So some of these folks have been joining me for a few weeks, and we have people online from there. And for those of you who are not in the class but have come out, we're so grateful. Uh, can you join me in welcoming David Worthington to come and speak? <laughs> Nothing to do with me, folks, honest. I could have made the step up, but I was told I needed to come through the curtain, so I don't know. Was that a more dramatic entrance? <laughs> yeah? Should we get some dry ice going, some lights flashing? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction, Chris. It was a real blessing to share with you and the folks when they came in 22. Um, and it's lovely to be here with you this evening. Uh, I hope what I have to share will be of some interest and some value. Uh, I hope what you'll take away from tonight is a sense in which the Wesley message is still one which is alive and one which needs to be told. And that's the reason why I make this commitment to come over to the United States to share these stories, because I want to inspire you in your work and your ministry, whether it's in Haddonfield, New Jersey, or any other location. Um, if the gig doesn't go well, yeah, I can talk baseball if you want, but let's see if we can get through maybe about an hour talking about all things Wesley. I was struck when I came in, the poster says, wisdom from the past, hope for the future. Which one of those do you want me to tackle first, I'm thinking? <laughs> wisdom from the past, hope for the future. Well, we do have a lot to learn from the Wesleys, unquestionably, and I hope what I'm going to share with you tonight will give you an insight into that. But I also hope that what will happen is that whilst you will want to learn more about what John and Charles did, not only in Bristol, but of course other parts of the country, including London, Oxford, Epworth, et c But the challenge is, what do we do with that work and that ministry today? Uh, I often use a Charles Wesley quote that is, uh, God buries his workers, but carries on his work. The Wesleys are buried, they are dead. That might be a surprising thing to hear from a guy who's here to talk to you about John and Charles Wesley, you may think. But, Folks, the responsibility has been passed to us. And in that sense, I hope what I have to share will inspire you in your work and your ministry. Right, would you be kind enough to move to the next slide, if you were? Seamless, isn't it? There I am, David Worthington, Director of Global Relationships. Uh, if you're curious, that stained glass window is one that we have at uh, the new room, uh, John Wesley's new room in Bristol, and highlights some of the significant moments in the life of John and Charles Wesley. Um, perhaps the most significant for me, as I look at that piece, right in the center, you will see John Wesley preaching to a crowd in the 18th century. But also notice, if you can, there are a couple of young children who are sat down with stripy jumpers. Uh, and I think that's important. We r e c o g n i z e that this is a ministry that is not stuck in the 18th century. It's rooted, but it's not stuck. 
Right, next question. Sorry, next uh, slide, if you would. Just going to give you a brief geography lesson. Okay, anybody want to leave at this point? No? Good. Well, the doors have been sealed anyway, so you're staying in, all right? Methodism comes to America, the Bristol connection. Well, from my travels around the US, and I've been very blessed to visit all those major league ballparks, but I've also visited over 40 of the US states. So I think I've got a, an insight into what you guys think and the way that you behave. Well, what has struck me is that many of you do know some of the Wesley story, but perhaps you don't know enough about the Bristol story. So whilst I'm not going to talk exclusively about Bristol, what I will say to you is that if you want to understand your Methodist heritage, you want to understand what happened in Bristol, it is, I think, important to reflect on what I have to share with you tonight. That image shows uh, Bristol in the 18th century. Bristol was a trading city, a maritime city. Uh, it's about 120 miles west of London. Now, I know that in US terms, that's absolutely of no significance whatsoever. I think you probably travel just to go to the supermarket, uh, sort of mileage, yeah? Um, but in the UK, it's, that's big, 120 miles away. Um, we are the gateway to the West Country, down into the counties of Devon and Cornwall, uh, or across to Wales. Um, and in that sense, as a maritime and trading city, we're also heavily involved in goods coming in from the colonies and from the Caribbean, cottons and tobaccos. And to our shame, we were also the primary port for slavery in England in the 18th century. And in that sense, we were the second city, second only to London in terms of influence and in terms of power. The metropolis of the West is another title that we were given. Right, next slide, if you would, please. Okay, well, in case you didn't know who these two guys are, there you have them, John Wesley and George Whitfield. Don't you love the way the two, two figures are put together? Who's looking at who, you might ask the question, yeah? Well, let's just share a little bit about why these two men are so significant. Uh, George Whitfield was born in the city of Gloucester, Gloucester about 30 miles north of Bristol. And uh, he, of course, had spent time in Savannah, Georgia. And he had returned to England where he wanted to re raise funds to return to America to build an orphanage. He had written to a number of his friends who he'd got to know at the Holy Club at Oxford University. That's where the word Methodist comes from, in case you're curious, because of the methodical manner of members of the Holy Club. So if you've learnt nothing else tonight, you know where the word Methodist comes from. One thing that actually emerged from Oxford. There you go. Well, John Wesley and George Whitfield, founders of the Methodist movement. It's an interesting statement that. I think many would probably say, no, John Wesley was the founder. Well, in the 18th century, George was much better known than John Wesley because of his preaching style. He was known as the great orator of Methodism. Um, and he had begun a very, uh, what, some consider to be a vulgar ministry, he'd begun to preach in the open air. Very unacceptable thing for an Anglican clergyman to do. And as a result, uh, George was often refused access to Anglican pulpits. And in that sense, what George does is he writes to a number of his friends and says, I want you to come to the city of Bristol to continue the work that I have begun in the city. He wrote the same letter to John. John was not initially persuaded that he should come to the city. And he actually wrote back and said, George, I still feel as I, I have a ministry to return to America to preach to the savages. We think he's probably referring to the Native Americans, but who knows? Perhaps some of the folks in Georgia were savages as well. Um, to which G George came back with a great quote. He says, John, you don't need to go all the way to America to preach to savages. There are plenty of them here in the city of Bristol. Well, he was referencing the Kingswood miners, uh, who were a very tough bunch indeed. Well, John Wesley is often referred to as his own biographer because, of course, he wrote extensively during his life, including diaries and journal entries. And so I just want to share a couple of those entries with you, which I think are so significant in understanding how John moves from being a high Anglican minister to the Methodist preacher that we know today. 31st of March, 1739, he writes, In the evening I arrived in Bristol and met Mr. Whitfield there. That's pretty straightforward so far, I'm sure we'd agree. What comes next, I think, is pretty powerful. He says, I could scarce reconcile myself at first to this strange way of preaching in the fields of which he, that's George Whitfield, set me an example on Sunday, having been all my life, and then he puts in brackets, till very lately, closes the bracket, so tenacious of every point relating to decency and order, 
that I would have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it had not been done in a church. Wow, what a statement for John Wesley to make. The saving of souls almost a sin if not done in a church. Well, that is John Wesley, the high Anglican writing, unquestionably. Well, the Bristol spirit got to him. Within two days, he's beginning to preach in the open air, and at four in the afternoon of the 2nd of April, 1739, words which you may be familiar with, but let's share them again, because they are so great. I submitted to be more vile, and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking from a little eminence in a ground adjoining the city to about three thousand people. Now I'm going to say those are preachers estimates from John. The Bristol population at that time was about 50,000 so that was a big number if he was. But even so I think let's just look at those words submitted to be more vile. A sense in which he recognized that if he was going to be effective in his ministry he needed to do something different to what he had learnt up until that point. And folks, I'm aware I've been following the situation closely about what's been going on within the Methodist Church here in the United States. And I think there is a sense in which, folks, you've got to think about submitting to be more vile and proclaim wherever is necessary. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the highways, but proclaim the glad tidings of salvation. Because, folks, if you don't do it, if I don't do it, who is going to do it? Right. Next slide. Well, just to illustrate what a radical ministry John Wesley had begun, and you will know those of you who've been doing study with Chris about the radicalism that's contained in those notes that he and Ashley have been working on together. Perhaps you might want to take that word away with you from tonight, radical. Well, of course, Wesley preaching the open air challenged the ecclesiastical authority in Bristol at that time, the Bishop of Bristol. And he wrote a letter to John in which he said, why are you here in the city of Bristol? I have not invited you here. You have no commission to be in my diocese. My best advice to you, therefore, is to go. That's not a very polite way to write to somebody, is it? Well, John Wesley composed a letter back to the bishop in which he said, I feel called to the city of Bristol. Until I feel called to go elsewhere, then here in Bristol, I will stay. Well, once the bishop had uh, <coughs> finished spluttering over his cup of tea, what, saying, what did that impertinent young man just write to me? He comes up with this phrase, I look upon all the world as my parish. Wow, what a phrase. John Wesley, eminently quotable, I'm sure you would agree. I look upon all the world as my parish. Thus far I mean that in whatever part of it I am, I judge it meet right and my bounden duty to declare unto all that are willing to hear the glad tidings of salvation. This is the work which I know God has called me to, and sure I am that his blessings attend it. Great encouragement have I therefore to be faithful in fulfilling the work he has given me to do. Contrast the strange way of preaching in the fields of which Mr. Whitfield set me an example to Great encouragement have I therefore to be faithful in fulfilling the work that God has given me to do. Do we have that clarity in our lives about this is the work which God has called me to? It's a question for us to reflect on. There in Bristol, that's the cathedral, and that, of course, is where the meeting took place between the two men. Uh, extra quiz question, if anybody can name the Bishop of Bristol, um, I'll give them $10. How does that sound? Yeah? Okay. I'm a generous man, really. Nobody ever knows the name of the Bishop of Bristol in 1739. Right. Next one. Next slide. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, here we are. We've got to John Wesley's new room, the oldest Methodist building in the world dating from the year 1739. Very significant, isn't it, that that is older than some countries around the world today. Yeah, it isn't it? Wait a minute, which country are you talking about, David? Oh, yeah, that one, yeah. So with the graces of respect, we're here in, this, in the state of New Jersey. We still think of you as the colonies, okay? I hope you don't mind me addressing you in that way, yeah? I hope you're not going to misbehave in a few years' time and cause us any trouble. 
I've got names of each of you, so just be careful. Right, so Wesley has begun his work in the city of Bristol. He's preaching in the open air. People are responding to this preaching. They not only want to learn more about what it means to be a Christian, to be a disciple, but they also need practical help and support. There was no access to a healthcare system, an education system. People needed support. And in that sense, what Wesley does is respond to both of those needs. He builds a meeting house. And the reason why it's known as the new room, and I will share this story with you, and then you will be forever in the little secret that we have. Why is it called the new room? Well, I'm going to give you the answer to that question that you didn't just ask, but I did. The new room in Bristol. Okay, so there were already religious societies meeting in the city of Bristol. We have a strong and long history of nonconformity with Baptists and Quakers as well as Methodists. Wesley was preaching in an upper room, and on one occasion, the floor collapsed. So many people crowded in to listen to Wesley. Wouldn't that be a good problem to have today? Yeah? Yeah. Are we on solid ground here, or is there a danger we're going to fall? We're good. Okay. So many people crowded in to listen to John Wesley that the floor collapsed. And so amongst all of that chaos, Wesley proclaimed to those who were present, we must build ourselves a new room. So that's why a building that goes back to the year 1739 is still called the new room to this day. And what I love about that in my 18 years of service at the new room is the sense in which every day is a new day. We open the doors, we engage with people, we welcome them in, all sorts of questions and issues that they want us to try and help with. But every day is a new day. But it was built as a meeting house for the religious societies. It was subsequently registered for religious worship, and in that sense it's owned by the British Methodist Church. But it is a meeting house in that sense of the word rather than a chapel in the way that perhaps you might think of with Wesley's Chapel in London often referred to as the cradle of Methodism, well, because the word Methodist started in Oxford, but of course what happens in Bristol is really what I think defines the word Methodist in the way we would understand that today. Of course, across the globe, Methodists celebrate Aldersgate Sunday. If it falls on the 24th of May, 1738, it's celebrated on that day, where John Wesley recorded in his journal about his heart being strangely warmed. That's a phrase familiar to you folks, isn't it? I'm sorry? Is anybody still out there? Yes, right, okay. Oh, you had me worried there for a minute. 24th of May, 1738. Well, not many folks know that Charles had a similar experience three days before, on the 21st of May, also in London. Um, But what's significant for me is reflect on what it means to have your heart strangely warmed. That's a great experience, isn't it? But you can just enjoy that moment of just being in the warmth, okay? I would respectfully suggest that what happens to John Wesley in Bristol in 1739 is the heart goes from strangely warmed to catching fire. And the work that he begins in the city defines Methodism as we know it today. And folks, if something catches fire, what do you do about it? Do you just bask in the moment? Not a good thing to do that, is it? So you need to respond to it, and that's exactly what John did and those who responded to his preaching. So the new room in that sense is a very special space. It's not just the oldest Methodist building in the world, but I also hope that it has an active work and a ministry to continue to this day. Just to illustrate the great rivalry between John Wesley's chapel in London and the new room in Bristol, just quickly share this one story with you. Many years ago at the British Methodist Church Annual Conference, the minister at the City Road Chapel in London, dating from 1770, stood up and said, I bring you greetings from the Mother Church of Methodism. That's a great line, isn't it? The Mother Church of Methodism. Well, subsequently, the warden at the New Room, it's a rather old-fashioned Methodist term, which I won't go into, but anyway, he stood up and began his address to conference with these words. I would like to bring you greetings from the Grandmother Church of Methodism, (laughs) who I am delighted to say is alive and well. That's a challenge alive and well. Well, I hope what I've been able to do over the last 18 years continues to demonstrate that point. And please don't think I have anything against my good friends in London. But the UK is a very London-centric country. I know I was born only 40 miles from London. But it's about time I think some love came to Bristol and the work that Wesley begins there. Because what happens 
in Bristol is a work which essentially defines the Methodist movement as we know it today. And the next slide, I hope, will illustrate that point. The creation of the class meeting structure. And again, I know you've been looking at this with Chris, for those of you who are involved with these classes, a sense in which you need to have a care and a concern for your fellow brother and sister and to hold each other accountable for the way in which you are conducting your lives. Well, you will not be surprised to know, of course, that the creation of the class meeting structure happens in which city? Come on, folks, you can do better than that. I'm going to ask this question again. If I don't get an affirmation, I'm leaving the stage, all right? <laughs> right, okay, are we warmed up? Are we ready? Okay, here we go. It's not a difficult question because you already know the answer. In which city did the class meeting structure begin? Bristol. Bristol. Thank you, my friends. You are very generous. Thank you. I'm sorry? <laughs> the Bristol Stomp. I'm interested to see how that works out. <laughs> I love hecklers, they're great. <laughs> Creation of the class meeting structures, holding each other accountable for the way in which we were living our lives. Is there something for us to look at today? Are we prepared to have our lives examined in the way that the early Methodists were? Are we prepared to have our class meeting tickets issued or are we even prepared to have them withdrawn? Because Wesley would withdraw tickets if he felt that you were not living up to the expectations of, a, of, of being a Methodist. Well, that, those are challenging words. I'm not going to get into whether you should or shouldn't have your class ticket removed. But clearly what's important is that what he is seeking to create are disciples of Jesus. Disciples of Jesus. Okay. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. Right, I've shown you the inside, let me show you the outside. This is the Broadmead Courtyard Garden. Uh, when the building was built in 1739, it was uh, essentially in a landlocked area which was dominated by commercial and residential property. Uh, following the end of the Second World War, you're probably aware that many cities in the UK were heavily bombed, London, Coventry, etc and anywhere which had a port, and that included Bristol, also lost a lot of buildings. The new room fortunately wasn't damaged, but it did uh, meant that the retail area that had been damaged then moved into the area in which we are today. Uh, I've often been asked the question, why did John Wesley build his uh, new room in the middle of a shopping mall? Um, to which the, <laughs> which the answer is, he didn't. Um, but... <laughs> But the way things are going with the retail at the moment, there won't be many, too many bricks and mortar sites available, will there? So we'll probably be there long after the retailers have gone as well. Well, the leader of Methodism. And this statue was commissioned in the 1920s. It, show, it shows John heading out on his next round of preaching engagements. Uh, and there he is sat atop the horse. Uh, just a quick aside uh, that I wanted to share with you, which I hope you'll find humorous. At least I think it's humorous, but you might not. That's always the danger. <laughs> Before we had uh, an education officer, I used to look after the school groups. So I gave the whole talk to this group of kids and focused on John Wesley, um, how important the horse was in the ministry. Of course, they thought you just jumped in your car or got on a train or got a plane. No, the horse was the only way you were going to get around. 250,000 miles traveled in his ministry. At the end of that talk, I asked the fatal question. Do any of you have any questions for me? <sighs> Set yourself up for trouble. Little boy puts his hand up and says, what was John Wesley's horse called? <laughs> okay, as the son of a teacher, I understand that if you don't know the answer to the question, you put the question back to the person who asked it. So I said, what would you have called John Wesley's horse? To which the little boy, who'd obviously thought about this, replied without hesitation, Alan. Do we have any Allens in the audience tonight? <laughs> well, there you go. Alan the horse. <laughs> now, <laughs> John Wesley, of course, would have had many horses during the course of his ministry, and this rather sort of defined um, thoroughbred horse probably was not the type of horse John Wesley travelled on, but even so. There is a real challenge here, folks. Bristol is a city that many people choose to visit. It has many historical links. We're close to Bath, and there's much to see in Bristol and admire. I hope we never get to the day 
where we have tour guides bringing people around. And they get to the courtyard and they see the statue and say, and here we have a statue of Alan the horse. <laughs> but we don't know who the rider is on top. <laughs> Do not misunderstand me here. What's important is that we need to get this message out there. And if we don't, then who is? Who is? Right, next statue. Uh, sorry. Next slide, if you would, of a statue of Charles Wesley. Uh, this is at the other end, um, our horse fair entrance. This is uh, Charles Wesley, commissioned in the 1930s. Uh, his arm is extended, his hand is open, um, and he's preaching. Uh, if you were given the challenge of just selecting one line from all those thousands of hymns that Charles had written, what would you choose? Well, it's a rhetorical question. I'm not going to give you the chance to answer, but think about it. The trustees came up with this one. Oh, let me commend my saviour to you. I think that's a great line, and uh, I, I applaud them for it. If ever you see statues of the two brothers and can't work out who's who, always look on top of the head. Why? Well, Charles was a typical 18th century gentleman. He would wear a wig when out in public. If you look closely, you can see he's wearing the wig. John, however, had decided as early as his days at Oxford University that wearing a wig was an unnecessary expense, it was an indulgence, and so he refused to wear one. Well. So if ever you see portraits or statues of the two brothers, always look on top of the head if you can't work out who's who. I'm giving you all of these tips. You are going to be so versed in all things Wesley at the end of tonight, aren't you? But Chris will ask you questions during the course of the next few weeks just to make sure you were paying attention. Next slide, please. Well, in addition to John Wesley's new room, we also have Charles Wesley's house. Charles Wesley lived in the city of Bristol from the year 1749 through to 1771. Why did he settle in the city of Bristol? Well, who wouldn't want to settle in the city of Bristol? Well, his mother-in-law and father-in-law were about uh, 40 miles away, and it was an equidistance then to London, so it probably made sense for him to be there. This was a property which the, the Wesley family rented. They didn't own it. And uh, a number of the children were, were born in this property, number four, Charles Street. Um, you always think of Charles Wesley as the, the great hymn writer, and of course that's right. But he was a poet, he was a lyricist, and in that sense he didn't write the music. One of the reasons why I think Charles's hymnody remains so popular, of course it can be set to contemporary tunes of the day. And that's exactly what Charles Wesley did in the 18th century. He set his words to contemporary tunes of the day. We believe the gift for playing music came down from mum, uh, Sarah Gwynne, or Sally Wesley, to give her her married name. Uh, there were eight children born from the marriage, three of whom survived to adulthood, including Charles Wesley Jr. and Samuel Wesley. Just to illustrate how the names could be used and reused in the 18th century, um, you may know that John and Charles were two of, I'm going to just pause for a dramatic effect here, but two of... 19 children born to their mother, Susanna. So if you ever heard her called the mother of Methodism, you know why, yeah? <laughs> and John Wesley was not the first John Wesley. There was another John Wesley who died in early infancy. But uh, the name Samuel is very common in the Wesley family. So uh, some of you may know that John and Charles's father was the Reverend Samuel Wesley. Their older brother, was the Reverend Samuel Wesley. Charles had a son, he called him Samuel Wesley. And what happened? Samuel has a son. Anybody want to take a guess at what he called his son? Alan. 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 <laughs> I'm pleased somebody's paying attention tonight. He called him Samuel. Samuel Sebastian Wesley, who was a noted composer from the Victorian times. So you can see why the Wesleys love a Samuel. Right, next slide. How are we doing okay for time? Yes. Oh, I've just spotted there's a clock there, yeah. It's all right, folks. There's only about another 15 minutes, all right? Okay. Oh, you're too kind. I'll give you that $20 later, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Birthplace of American Methodism. I hope what I've shared with you so far illustrates how important the city of Bristol and the establishment of Methodism in England, and yet I would also contend that what happens in the city of Bristol is significant to American Methodism. Why? Well, one name I'm going to quote to you, Francis Asbury. We all know who that is, don't we? 
If not, go and see Chris after this lecture, and he will tell you, but I'll tell you a little bit more. Francis Asbury, who was already an itinerant Methodist preacher, attended his first ever Methodist conference that was held at the New Room in 1771. Another quiz question for you here, folks. Where was the first ever Methodist conference held? Sorry, folks, trick question. London. Ah, you see. 1744. However, where were most Methodist conferences held during John Wesley's lifetime? Spot on. 19, including the last ever John Wesley attended in 1791. If you look at the minutes of the 1771 conference, Wesley proclaims to those present, and these are Wesley's words, not mine, our brethren in America call aloud for help. Who is willing to go over and serve? And Asbury says, I made an offer of myself, and it was considered by Mr. Wesley and others, that I had a call. I had a call. Wow. What a modest statement for such a wonderful ministry. He then set sail from, next slide, the little village of Pill in Somerset. Uh, it's only about five miles from Bristol city centre. They set sail the early Methodist preachers from there because it was cheaper to do so than from the centre of Bristol. Some of you may be familiar with the American artist Kenneth Wyatt, who painted a number of Methodist images, including Offer Them Christ, uh, which shows John Wesley bidding farewell to Thomas Coke, Richard Watcote, and Thomas Vasey. As you can see from that slide, not quite how it looks in that artistic image. But never mind, it was the embarkation point for America for Francis Asbury in 1771. Next slide, if you would. Where did he end up? Anybody know this building? Yeah. Your friend Bill? My friend Bill. We're all friends with Bill. Excellent. I was preaching there on Sunday. I preached from the, from the pulpit because, of course, I'm six-footed, but contradiction. At least I try to be. The Cathedral Church of America Methodism, the first place that Asbury spoke when he arrived there. It took you six weeks to get over the Atlantic at that time. It took my wife and I about seven hours, yeah? What a difference, yeah. And of course, if you've not visited there, I would encourage you to learn more about that story about Francis Asbury and the work that he begins in Philadelphia and then, of course, up and down the eastern seaboard. Next slide, if you would. Who's been here? Barrett's Chapel, Frederica, Delaware. Yeah? Somebody been? Yeah? I can't see how many of you are. There, there, there aren't that many, really, are there? No? Folks, you've got a lot of heritage here. You should be enjoying it. This is Methodist heritage. Barrett's Chapel. Why is that significant? Well, in 1784, this is where Francis Hasbury met with Thomas Coke. What did they do there? They said, we need to call a conference of preachers. That conference of preachers took place over the Christmas period of 1784, and that's, of course, where the American Methodist Episcopal Church was founded. You knew all of that, didn't you? Well, you do now. <laughs> well... You may cry to me. Where is it that that ordination took place for those men to come over to America? Next slide. Number six, Dighton Street in Bristol. Sadly, that building is no longer there. It was the victim of the Luftwaffe during the Second World War. But Wesley ordained Watcote and Vasey and Coke to come over to America with a letter that became known as, and if you go to the next slide, the Magna Carta of American Methodism. This is just a quick aside, which I hope you'll indulge me for a moment. I was in Dallas, Texas in October of this year. I spoke at Southern Methodist University. Some of you may know that the George W. Presidential Library is located in that university. Um, I won't name the Methodist professor who said to me there are only two books in that library. Uh, both of which require colouring pencils. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger, folks, all right? <laughs> a 
Listen, that's what I was told. Well, I wanted to go in. I thought it'd be interesting to look, at, look around. I'd been to see his father's presidential library, which is in College Station. And you only pay $10 to get into that. They wanted $25 for the George W. Presidential Library in uh, Dallas. I said, I'm not paying that. Oh, yeah, but you get to see the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. I said, well, I've seen all of those in the National Archive building in DC. Oh, but you also get to see the Magna Carta. I said, have you not worked out where I'm from? <laughs> I can go and see the Magna Carta for free any time I want. Well, at which point the lady decided this brick guy is just too much trouble. So, uh, yeah, I didn't pay to go in. I thought I'd charm my way in, but never quite made it. There we go. And there's the Bushes, who are Meth Methodists, and they wouldn't let me in, free of charge. Outrageous. Outrageous. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's contained in the Magna Carta of American Methodism? I think it's some fascinating words. I'm going to share some of them with you tonight. Never let it be said that John Wesley did not have a sense of humor, okay? Has anybody ever said that to you? <laughs> well, I have now, but he doesn't. He has a sense of humor. These are some of the words that are contained within that Magna Carta of American Methodism. He says, to Dr. Coke, Mr. Asbury, and our brethren in North America, by a very uncommon train of providences, many of the provinces of North America are totally disjoined from the British Empire and erected into independent states. Oh, if only we'd given George Washington that commission in the British Army, it would have been so different. The English government has no authority over those independent states, either civil or ecclesiastical, any more than over the states of Holland. A civil authority is exercised over them, partly by the Congress, partly by the provincial assemblies but no one either exercises or claims any ecclesiastical authority at all. In this peculiar situation, and this is where the humor really kicks in, this is John Wesley writing, some thousands of the inhabitants of these states, that's you guys, desire my advice, and in compliance with their desire, I have drawn up a little sketch. <laughs> Do you want to know how John Wesley thought that the American Methodist Church should establish itself? Because according to John, you did. Well, it's true to say that once Coke and Asbury got together, things started to happen. And that's the next slide, if you would. There they are, Thomas Coke, Francis Asbury, the first bishops of American Methodism. You may be interested to know that we do not have bishops in the British Methodist Church, I think partly because John Wesley had so many run-ins with bishops over the years. He'd been to petition the Bishop of London in 1784, who at that time was still responsible for preachers in the colonies. Well, the bishop said, I'm not sending any more over there, they're now an independent country. But Wesley said, no, they still require more, and that's why Watcote and Basie and Coke go over. Well, at that uh, Christmas conference, you probably know that uh, Coke and Asbury moved from being elders to uh, uh, ministers to superintendents to bishops within about three days. <laughs> That's going through the ranks quickly, isn't it? Well, Wesley wrote to Asbury in which he expressed his concern that Asbury had taken the title of bishop. Asbury responds brilliantly, and this is why I think Asbury was so successful and understood the American mind. He said, I have not taken the title bishop. It has been conferred upon me by the conference. Smart cookie, that Francis Asbury, yeah? Well, of course, he remained an itinerant preacher, traveling up and down the eastern seaboard, uh, dying in 1816. Right, next slide, yep. Well, you guys loved him so much, there are two statues of Francis Asbury here in the United States. Anybody know where that upper image is from? DC, yep, very good. Do you know the exact location? 19, 19th and Mount Pleasant Street, but what's a few streets between friends, yeah? And the one below? Chris, you're banned from this one. <laughs> That's true university. That statue of Francis Asbury was unveiled in 1924 by President Calvin Coolidge. 
I wonder if there are any current bishops in the UMC that will have a statue unveiled to them in DC in a few years' time. Well, let me just read some of the words that are inscribed on that statue. The pioneer Methodist bishop in America. His continuous journey through cities, villages, and settlements from 1771 to 1816 greatly promoted patriotism, education, morality, and religion in the American Republic. On the other side of the base, and these really are challenging words, do you think we can live up to these words today? If you seek for the results of his labor, your labor, my labor, our labor, you will find them in our Christian civilization. And on the back, the prophet of the long road. He traveled something around 200,000 miles in his ministry as well. So, folks say to me, what's the most significant city in the establishment of the American Methodist movement? Is it New York? Is it Philadelphia? Is it Frederica, Delaware? Is it lovely name Baltimore? To which, rather biased, I would say, mm, yeah, they have cases, but... It's John Wesley's new room in Bristol, which I think is the most significant. Wow, nobody's going to come back to me on that one, eh? I've made this bold statement. I think I've got away with it. Wow. Nobody want to challenge me? Okay, that's fine. But joking aside, folks, I think what's important is that you understand that the work that Wesley begins in that city is then brought across the Atlantic, and of course Asbury, Coke, and many others were responsible for taking that message up and down the eastern seaboard. I've often remarked, I'm a huge music fan, does Bruce Springsteen know that his debut album is named after Francis Asbury? <laughs> does anybody have Bruce's number that I could give him a ring just to check that with him? Who knows? But, you know, there are so many, you know, healthcare facilities, education facilities that have that Methodist name, whether it's Asbury, Coke, and many others. Folks, Methodism is built into the United States DNA. You've got a great story to share, so share it, yeah? I'm just a mad Englishman that comes in for an hour and gives you a talk, you know? It's not my responsibility to go and do that, that's your responsibility. But how do we get that message over to those folks? Of what relevance of what we're sharing tonight to those folks who are passing these doors, whether in Haddonfield, Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore? Why is it relevant to them? Well, we think it's relevant because we want those individuals to have a personal relationship with Jesus. We want them to find ways in which they find fulfillment in their life, an opportunity to have that one-to-one -one relationship, to become a disciple of Jesus. And I know Chris has a real passion inside him and it really weighs heavy on his heart. So, folks, you make sure you support him in that ministry, okay? Because uh, if you don't, I'll come back. There is work to be done here, folks, all right? Next slide, if you would. So what I've shared with you is focused primarily on the 18th century and the way in which the movement changed. But one of the challenges we faced was how do we find a practical use for John Wesley's new room today? Back in 2017, we completed what we called the Horse Fair Project. And the reason why that was significant is it would allow us to welcome more people into the space. We were welcoming about 25,000 people per annum. We're now up to 50,000. We've got a cafe. We've got a library. We've got meeting rooms. We've got an expanded museum, all of which allow us to tell that story. But most importantly, we open our doors and we welcome everyone in them. We don't make any requirements that you have to believe or say this or do that come and engage with us, because we want to engage with you. And in my ministry, and I know that Chris, and I'm sure anybody else here who's involved in ministry will know, that you don't have the luxury of sitting down and spending seven hours every day working out your sermon for Sunday, do you? You know, there are people coming to you with needs. And in that sense, that what, that's what goes on at the noon. What a privilege that many of those people who are struggling with homelessness, addiction, alcoholism, drugs, whatever it may be, they believe that the church is a place where they can come 
for care and support. And as I was saying to Chris earlier, you know, sometimes my day, and I'm sure Chris and others who are in ministry, is just a listening ministry where people are being heard for the first time. They want to share their burdens. They want other people to think there is somebody that cares about what's going on in my life. That's why the Wesleys and the early Methodists were so effective in their ministry. They didn't just talk it, they actually walked it. And in that sense, perhaps we should be judged not by how good the quality of our sermons are or the number of people that are sat on the seats, but what's our engagement with the poor, the disenfranchised, the hard to reach, the difficult to engage with. That should be the judge as to whether our ministry is effective. So if you do come to the new room, no, scrub that, when you come to the new room, I hope that what you will find is a space in which there is work going on and that we are alive and well. Somebody wrote that it's a place where people come in and go out renewed. Many people who come spend quite a short period of time with us and yet I hope that seeds will be sown which will see great fruit. I will not see where those fruits are growing, but I do know that work is going on in people's hearts. So whether they're coming from the United States, from Korea, any other part of the world, the reality is that people still come to John Wesley's New Room to learn this story, but they don't just hear the story and bury it, they do something with it. And I'm always struck by the parable of the master who gives his servants the talents. I don't know about you folks, the first time I heard that and thought, well, the servant who went and buried it and then brought it back up for the master, he didn't do a bad thing with it, did he? But that was not what was required. We are required to do something useful with it. And in that sense, I hope that what we're doing at the new room fulfills that. Next slide, if you would. In the museum uh, above, we have um, that top slide shows John Wesley's bed and one of his preaching gowns. And uh, the lower slide shows um, the common room of the museum. I would love to be a fly on the wall. The conversations that would have taken place there in Wesley's time about the planning and scheming for what was going to happen. Always remember, folks, the Wesleys did not know the beginning, the middle, and the end of their ministry. They were reliant upon God and his prompting and the way in which they were to live their lives and fulfill their ministry. And uh, I got this quote, permission from Ashley Boggan. Ashley, as you probably know, is the General Secretary for the Commission of Archives and History, and she was very generous. She said, a place where new energy and spirit is given to John Wesley's story. Now, those are challenging words, new energy and spirit given to John Wesley's story. It's a story, but it's one we need to keep telling. Next slide, if you would. Uh, this is just a cutaway showing, uh, if you can see on the left-hand side, the chapel space, the preacher's rooms where the museum is located, and those new facilities, including the library, the archive, the um, uh, cafe, for example. So, you know, how do you use that space? How do you make sure that work continues to this day? Well, that's what we've sought to do, and we hope that that work continues. I'm going to conclude. Yeah, I'm doing pretty well for time, aren't I? Sorry, did somebody say you wanted another half hour? <laughs> Trust me, folks, it is coming to an end. <laughs> right, next slide, if you would. Now... I mentioned a little earlier that I did have the opportunity to see the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, Constitution. I saw those at the National Archives buildings in DC, and I'm sure some of you will have been at some point in your life. You know that when you go through those, there is very heavy security, okay? Anybody seen the film National Treasure? That is so accurate, isn't it? You know? I mean, you can just walk in and basically buy one from the shop and swap it, yeah? It's that easy really is that easy. Nicolas Cage, you're a genius. <laughs> well, on the corner of the National Archive, there are four, four corners. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Four corners. Yeah, okay, here we go. Maths lesson. Right. <laughs> Statues with quotes. And the quote that I picked up 
was one from Wendell Phillips, who's a 19th century American abolitionist. And I want to leave this quote with you because for me, it inspires me in what I do every day. And I hope it will inspire you when you reflect on what I've shared tonight and how you can continue the work that the Wesleys began. The heritage of the past. We are talking about a heritage building. Is the seed. Reflect on the parable of the seed and the sower. What was the responsibility of the sower when he got up that morning? Was it that every seed that he sowed was going to produce good fruit? No. Was it every seed that he sowed not going to produce good fruit? No. Some was going to grow, some was going to produce good fruit, others not. However, if you don't go out and sow seed, how much fruit will grow? None. What's the lesson we learn from that? We have to go out and we have to sow seed. We may not see that come to fruition. Some of the brilliant work which we've all been involved with, me particularly, you know, brilliant work I've been involved with. I'm a very modest Englishman, really. But look, the reality is, if we don't go out and sow seeds, then we're, there, there will be nothing, absolutely nothing. So think about that. The heritage of the past is the seed that brings forth the harvest of the future. Do we want to see a revival in this country? Come on, guys. We can do better than that, can't we? Do we want to see a revival in this country? Yes. yes. Okay. How are we going to do it? Sowing seeds. Be more vile. Challenge. You know? We're too nice. I mean, come on. I'm British. We're too nice in Britain. I thought you guys had a pioneering spirit to you. Come on. You need to go out. You need to proclaim the gospel. Not necessarily from the streets in the way that the Wesleys did. But just think, what is it that I can do that will help Chris and the staff here at Haddonfield? What is it that I can do that's going to have an impact? How am I being faithful to what God has called me to do and to be? Those are questions that are worth asking. And hopefully there will be some answers that will come to you. Because I think that we are at a critical moment. We know it's not just the United Methodist Church. It's many Christian churches which are struggling. Why? Well, I'm not going to try and critique that in, in the space of a couple of minutes. But what I am going to say to you is that I think that we have a responsibility to go out and to be more bold, to be more vile, to engage with people where they are. Why? Because that's what the Wesleys did. But more importantly, that's what we are called to do through Christ and his ministry. You know? The prostitutes, the tax collectors, the difficult to find, the fishermen, the plain, the simple folk. You know? As Chris and I were discussing earlier, folks, it's not going to come from the top. All right? No movement that ever successful came from the top. It comes from the bottom. It's us stepping up taking that responsibility and finding a way to share. That doesn't mean we have to be brilliant at hymn writing or preaching the word. How do we find a way to engage with our neighbours? How do we find a way to invite a friend to church? How do we offer a lift to somebody who needs to go to a hospital appointment? Small things, but small things count, and they have an impact. I'm not going to ask each of you to share your testimony here tonight. But is it not true to say that the majority of us have become Christians because of the influence of others in our lives? It's not because we've read the gospel or we've sung a, sung a great hymn. We've seen something different in the way that people have behaved towards others. They've given them a courtesy. They've given them an opportunity to share. And that, I think, is a real challenge for each of us. And trust me, folks, the finger's pointing at much as me as it is you, you know? So I hope what I've been able to share tonight has given you some insight into why I continue to feel enthused about the John Wesley story, the Charles Wesley story, the Francis Asbury story. But do not forget, God has buried his workers, but he carries on his work. And that work goes on through you and me and all of us here in this room tonight. I hope you will get the opportunity to come over to Bristol and to learn a little bit more about why we're so enthused in that Wesley story. But ultimately, you will come back to Haddonfield or wherever it is that you're living at that time 
and you will have that responsibility to continue the work, to sow the seeds. And in that sense, I commission you to do that work. Um, and as I say, if not, I'll be back. <laughs> right, thank you, folks. Uh, yeah, happy to. Um, the answer to the first question is Alan. Um, right, let's, let's move on to the next question then, please. Just raise your hand, I'll bring a mic. Oh, I'm loud and clear. We, <laughs> we have folks online oh, who would appreciate a mic. Number one heckler here, first time caller. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fraser is listening. All right. I was curious if you got to visit any of the small churches in New Jersey, southern New Jersey, that Asbury founded, um, because there, there are so many beautiful ones that are just amazing to me. Have you uh, well, I was in uh, Ocean City, New Jersey, earlier today, gave a, a brief talk at uh, uh, lunchtime. Um, Bob Williams is here tonight. Bob is a member at uh, that church and uh, retired general secretary of GCAH. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I'm very aware that, um, as in the UK, the majority of UMCs are quite small churches, very faithful folk. Um, and in that sense, it's not all mega churches. Um, but I think what's important is that there is work and ministry going on. Now, does that mean that those buildings have to be retained? Well, maybe, maybe not. We are facing a difficult issue in the UK. We have far more property in our portfolio than we, we will ever need. Um, and in that sense, I think Wesley would say, well, if it is serving no useful purpose for any longer, then let it go. Of course, it has history and it has heritage, and that should be recognized. But if it's serving no useful purpose, and that's why that quote about, you know, I bring you greetings from the grandmother church of Methodism, you know, who is alive and well. And that, I think, is a very relevant question that we need to ask of ourselves and our churches. Are we alive and well? Um, so I hope that that, that helps. Okay. Okay. Today, David uh, visited a congregation where John Wesley, or where uh, Francis Asbury came. Do you know where that is? Cape May? Haddonfield, New Jersey. Oh, Haddonfield. <laughs> there you go. Even I don't know the answer to every question. Um, David, could you say something more about slavery in Bristol and John Wesley's role uh, as an abolitionist? We don't really get a lot of that information. Okay, yeah. It's, happy. it's, it's really important. Absolutely it is. Um, Bristol, as I said, 18th century maritime city. Much of the city's wealth was built on trading, including slavery. Um, back in 2020, during the COVID pandemic, there was a Black Lives March matter that went through the city of Bristol. Um, there is or was a statue to a famous Bristol philanthropist by the name of Edward Colston. Um, many people within the Bristol community had said, yes, he did great works and he provided much finance for many good things, but how did he make his money? He made it because he was involved in the slave trade. I don't think it's appropriate to have a statue of such a gentleman uh, in the city centre today. And there were many who agreed with that. As a result, that statue was torn down and rolled through the streets, and like the slaves who died on the ships over from West Africa, was tossed into the sea. Um, it's still a very, very contentious issue in the city of Bristol. How do we in the 21st century apologise for our role in the slave trade? Uh, a trade which, of course, was banned in British ships in 1807. You're right to say that John Wesley was an abolitionist. He wrote his Thoughts Upon Slavery booklet in 1771. It was regularly published throughout the course of his life, and he was a constant thorn in the side of the Bristol authorities. He famously preached his Thoughts Upon Slavery sermon um, in the New Room in 1788. Anybody know how old John Wesley was in 1788? born in the year 1703, 85 years old. Anybody here at that age here tonight? Oh, good, thank you, sir. 
would you want to stand up in front of an audience of thousands and proclaim to a very hostile audience around the issue of slavery? Yes. Thank you, brother. <laughs> because that's exactly what John Wesley did. He knew that many people were there to actually not only shout and cause disruption, but even perhaps even to offer him physical harm. He said at one point he feared for his life, and yet the commotion died back down. Wesley was um, a mentor to the likes of William Wilberforce. Is that a name known to some of you folks here tonight? William Wilberforce was a, uh, a, a member of parliament in uh, the British parliament, uh, seen very much as the, uh, the man responsible for ultimately bringing in the Slave Trade Act of 1807, um, which banned slavery in British ships. But I hope what I've been able to illustrate is that slavery remains a very difficult issue. Uh, what's interesting for me is that there were many other uh, buildings and streets named in Bristol for Colston, and yet within days, literally days, of the statue being torn down, uh, all of those buildings and streets were renamed. The Colston statue, it's now been agreed, will go into the Bristol Museum, and there will be an opportunity to look at that statue, but in the context of not just a philanthropist, but also a slave owner as well. Now, I'm not sure the timeline for the bringing down, I know there's a number of Confederacy statues that were brought down in Richmond, Virginia over the last few years. I'm not sure whether that happened before or after um, 2020 for Bristol. There is one thing I would say to you, though, which is that the Thoughts Upon Slavery booklet and sermon that Wesley wrote, it was essentially a booklet written by a Philadelphian Quaker called Anthony Benazee. And in that sense, I think if um, we you know, had access to the internet like we do today, he probably would have been up for plagiarism. Um, but because he was such a well-known name, he was able to put his name to it and claim the credit for it. Um, some of you may know that the George Whitfield statue at the University of Pennsylvania has been removed, I believe, within the last year or so, because the university said of his connections with the slave trade down in Georgia. Uh, Benjamin Franklin escaped that because, as many of you are probably aware, he did establish an abolition movement in Philadelphia shortly before he died. But, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not here to lecture you on the issue of slavery here in the United States, but I think what is very clear is that um, it remains a very, very difficult issue to have a reasoned debate on. Um, and in that sense, I think it requires maturity um, to look at the issues and to try and understand them from the 18th century perspective, but also understand why it's such a difficult topic in the 21st century. But make no mistake, John Wesley was on the, I would describe, the right side of history. The Thoughts Upon Slavery sermon illustrates that. And if you do want to look at a very famous piece, then do go to the archive at Drew. I think I'm right in saying, Bob, that you do have the original letter that John Wesley wrote to William Wilberforce in which he encouraged him to continue his efforts to lobby British Parliament to bring the Slave Trade Act of 1807 in. So if you want to see that letter, it is available. I can see a hand over there. I guess you probably want to take the microphone, yeah. How would uh, John and Charles Wesley, how did they support their families and to build that uh, community house? And did they have, was that their job? Were they supported by the people that came to worship? Good question. Uh, there are a variety of sources from which they generated income. Um, first one to say is John remained a fellow at Lincoln College uh, until his marriage. Um, so there would be a stipend that would come from that. Uh, one of the early supporters of the early Methodist movement was uh, a lady called Selina, the Countess of Huntingdon. Uh, she established her own connection um, for those early Methodist preachers, including George Whitfield. Um, the other way in which income was generated, John Wesley wrote and published extensively during his life, not only the, the journal, but of course um, uh, publications like Primitive Physic, which gave people uh, some ideas as to how they could uh, um, come up with some remedies to deal with medical issues they were experiencing. Um, and of course, the class meetings, uh, where you would pay a penny a week 
uh, to the class meeting and that would allow an income to be generated. One of the great things that I love to celebrate is that um, there was another uh, charity established from that called Stranger's Friend. Uh, and even to this day, in my capacity at the chapel, um, I have access to the Stranger's Friend Fund. And that enables me, where I consider it appropriate to do so, to offer some financial assistance, usually in the form of buying something practical like a, uh, a bus ticket or uh, formula milk or something of that nature. Um, uh, because when they paid the penny a week, anything that was left over would be put toward the stranger's friend. But it, it, it is, a, a, I think, relevant that the questions asked around finance, because you know we have to recognise that uh, you know these buildings don't just stay open and lit and heated just through sheer prayer power alone. We do need to find a way to generate our income sources. I don't know when your Giving Sunday is coming up, but I'm sure Chris would certainly encourage you to think about the level of giving that you're able to give. Um, and of course, tithing is a good way to start that. Am I doing a good job here, Chris, just promoting that, yeah? Okay, yeah, okay, good, good. <laughs> yeah, because look, the reality is, you know, unless we make that financial commitment, we can't do the work which God has called us to, bottom line, you know? Um, I hope that's helpful on the finance question. I think we've time for a few more questions. I have one here and then one in the front. Um, I really enjoy your British accent. <laughs> I can't see you. I'm right here. <laughs> All right. Hi. Yeah, um, I've, I've worked on it. I think it's really good now. <laughs> yeah, we butcher yeah. it here. I am we? originally from Louisiana, but you probably wouldn't <laughs> understand. Yeah. Um, I, the statue of uh, John on the horse made me think of the transition from itinerancy to like an established building as far as like the establishment of, of brick and mortar churches. And I guess I am interested in that transition and what made them like how many generations did it take for churches to take hold in communities? Um, from that idea of, of itinerancy. And also, do you see any vestiges of itinerant preachers that exist today um, in Methodism, like as far as camp meetings or anything like that? Does that still exist? Yes. Yeah, so um, whenever we use the word Methodism, we have to recognize that many people will interpret that word in many different ways. Um, and in that sense, even fairly early on into Wesley's ministry of actually, as you say, you know, building the new room and having a bricks and mortar, uh, the primitive Methodists, as they were known, which of course were established here in America, the primitive Methodists began in America, uh, would continue that camp meeting tradition. You know, they were concerned that by um, putting up buildings, you essentially were committing yourself to paying out monies instead of continuing the work of engaging with the poor and the disenfranchised. So Wesley, I think, recognized very early on that there was a decision to be made as to whether you know, he continued with the open-air preaching. I think he's, he, he chose the meeting houses because I think what you saw in Britain in the 18th century or towards the end of the 18th century and, of course, uh, you know, then taken around the world is, is the Industrial Revolution and people were essentially moving into towns and cities. And in that sense, they were beginning to establish roots within those cities. So they weren't itinerant in quite the same way as the Methodists were itinerant because they were living in that particular city. So I think that it's important to recognize that Wesley did make that commitment to allow a bricks and mortar property to be built. But I would go back to that other point I mentioned, that you know, if a building is no longer serving a useful purpose, we should be prepared to give it up. And I think that's a real challenge. You know, how do you make that difficult decision that a church that's been in your conference for 100 years or whatever, you know, if, it's, if it's now not in the place where it's serving a, a ministry, are we willing to let it go and allow it? Um, John, of course, remained an itinerant preacher for virtually the whole of his life. It was only in the latter stages of 1791 that he then essentially settled in London uh, to allow him to um, sort of begin to recognize that he couldn't be an itinerant preacher in the way that he had. Charles, of course, um, recognized that if he was going to have a successful marriage, he probably needed to cut his itinerant preach. And uh, in that sense, 
Uh, once he married Sally, uh, he then essentially spent time in Bristol, London, but those are the only two locations. Um, and in that sense, um, I think I've always got a soft spot for Charles. Uh, I can't speak on behalf of anybody else, but if you had the opportunity to spend time with one or other of the two brothers, which one would you choose? I'd always go with Charles, um, not least of which I think he understood the, the value of establishing and maintaining relationships. Uh, shortly after Charles's death, I'm sorry if I'm going off a bit of a tangent, but I, I did want to share this because I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's helpful. Um, shortly after Charles died, his widow, Sally, was asked what she thought Charles's greatest gift was. Now, I suspect if any of us were asked that question, we would answer his hymnody, and that would be a very legitimate response. But she came up with, he was a man made for friendship. That's a challenging statement, isn't it? Is your wife or husband going to say to you, he or she was a person made for friendship? Because that's what Sally said about her husband, Charles. Um, and you're going to get this joke, I know you are, because you're paying close attention tonight. We have no evidence that John's wife, Molly Vazell, ever described John as a man made for friendship. <laughs> have I answered your question about itinerancy? Great, thank you. And then I think there was time for one final question. Question. Oh. Let's try the other end. <laughs> That's been the problem my whole ministry. I had the wrong <laughs> uh, I, Each of us here hope that uh, your visit uh, in Haddonfield has been a good one, and uh, we pray that you do not have to write in your journal tonight, as Asbury wrote in his, preached in Haddonfield today was much oppressed by the devil. <laughs> well, I sincerely hope not. Um, but um, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I am most appreciative, and uh, it's just wonderful to share with you. And I hope you've learned something. I hope that you've had a bit of a laugh from time to time. But there is a serious message, folks, and that is we've got to reclaim the identity of Methodism, and we've got to find a way to share that story with those today because they are aching for it. And if we don't do it, no one else will. So... Power to your brother, power to your sister. Go out and share the word. Thank you. Thank you, David. We're so grateful that you're here. Um, and we have a number of pastors. I, I just wanted you to know that there are a number of clergy. If you're a clergy person, licensed, local, ordained, doesn't matter what the status, can you just stand up? Um, we have a... I know that we had a few other folks here who have given their lives to, to sow these seeds, and we're grateful for them. Thank you all. You, you can have a seat. Um, yeah, let's thank them for their presence. I'm going to invite uh, Reverend Dr. Bob Williams, who was a, a, a mentor to me and a mentoring spirit. Uh, Bob, you served at St. Andrews in Cherry Hill? 14 years. For 14 years, and was the General Secretary of Archives and History for how long? Eight and a half. Eight and a half. And so Bob is um, the Uber driver for David uh, tonight, and he's going to give us our closing prayer. I send you forth uh, with the words of a Charles Wesley hymn. Blessed be the dear uniting love that will not let us part. Our bodies may far off remove. We still are one in heart. May you go forth reinvigorated by the story of the Wesleys, and Barbara Heck, and Harry Hoosier, and Richard Allen, and Francis Willard, and so many others. May you go forth reinvigorating, knowing that we claim our heritage for the sake of the future. We don't mortgage the future for the sake of the past. Go forth in peace, and may the God of peace go with you, and grant you a night of rest, knowing that God's mercies are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Amen. Amen. Amen.